This is PBS. About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation. Welcome to today's program. It's called About Old House Energy Efficiency. Now we're going to talk about HVAC and insulation in this show. Whoa, HVAC, that's a big word. Well, what it means in the industry is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And we're going to show you a lot of different ways that you can make your old house energy efficient. It's very important. We can restore them all day long, but if we can't afford to live in them, it's not going to do us much good. So let's go take a look. Hey, Todd. All right. Thanks for coming over so quick. You getting it cleaned up for me? We're getting all cleaned up. Is it a mess? It's pretty dirty. Is it? Yeah. What, do you, what all are you doing to it? Oh, we're cleaning the burners and the blower and oil in the blower motor. Getting everything inside of it working well. Ready for winter. Don't tell me this is the furnace filter that was in there. That's the one. Oh, my gosh. This thing is filthy. Well, we've been renovating this old house for about nine months. And the one thing that uh, does happen is you get a lot of gunk. It's amazing how much. And you should change your furnace filter once a month. If you do that, you're going to be in great shape. Now, this is a conventional furnace filter, kind of like the one we just looked at, fiberglass mesh. You can almost see through it. Now, here's one of these really high efficient ones. You can't see through this at all. It has a very tight mesh here. And in fact, sometimes it's so tight the air can't flow through very well in these uh, more modern high efficiency furnaces and make, it, make the furnace actually whistle and stop the airflow. So you're better off changing it every month with one of these types of conventional ones. And then also make sure you have it cleaned once a year. If you do this, your furnace is going to last 25 to 35 years, a convent, you know, one of these types of forced air furnaces. But if you don't, you're talking 10 to 15 years, and we've seen some pretty trashed out ones at oh, 10. Yeah. Yes, we have. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Now, the other thing that's important is this. This behemoth right here is called a heat exchanger. And the burners heat this all up in the air inside, and then the flow comes through from the blower underneath and blows the air up through the ductwork. If there's a lot of humidity in the basement and you haven't cleaned your furnace, you're going to get all this rust here. And what happens then is you get pinholes in this and cracks, and carbon monoxide can escape and make you sick and even kill you. So the bottom line to this is two points. One is clean your furnace because it'll make it more efficient. And the other one, of course, is it's a safety issue. Now, what makes this furnace more efficient? What you do, you recycle your um, flue gases and convert them to heat to your house. Well, on a conventional furnace, if I'm not mistaken, the flue gases escape out through the chimney at about 450 degrees. What are we talking about the flue gases here? Oh, around 80 degrees. So you're really saving a lot of that heat that exactly. was escaping before. That right. makes a lot of sense. And what blows it? Is there some? How does it escape? Well, from we the got furnace? A, we got a vent motor here. Okay. And it blows it out. Well, that's even a more important reason to have the furnace checked because you got to make sure it's blowing the gases right. out. Right. Exactly. Now this PVC pipe comes up and wraps around the back of the furnace comes over here and goes straight out the side of the house. Now that's kind of nice because then you don't have to go up through an old chimney and line it. You can just go straight out through the side of the house. So keep your furnace clean and it'll keep you safe. Hot water heating systems have been with us since central heating was invented and they're really efficient ways to heat your house. Now think of the forced air heating system down in your basement. The furnace heats up the air, blows it up through ducts. Well, as it's going through the ducts, it cools down. On the other hand, in a hot water heating system, a boiler heats up the water down below. The hot water comes through the system. It heats up the radiators. It gets out, but the radiators stay warm. It's a really nice, warm heat, and people like it. It has a lot of nice filigree on these radiators. They can be very beautiful. A big mistake a lot of people make is they take these radiators out and they put in this baseboard radiator system. And it's just not as efficient. Most of the people that I've talked to in over 20 years have told me that when they do it, they wish they'd kept the old radiators. Now that's not all technical and I don't have all the numbers. I just go off how I like the heat from a radiator as compared to a baseboard. 
Now a couple things about a radiator. One is the bleeder valve. That's what this little valve is right here. Now there's a key that goes on that. And this valve is there because when you turn off the system in the spring, and by the time you turn it back on in the fall, air can get in here and that makes it inefficient and it can make a banging sound in a radiator. Have you ever heard that? We well, turn this on and if some air comes out, you keep it on until a solid stream of water comes out. All right, this one has a solid stream of water, so there's no air in there, so that's a good thing. Now back here, you have a valve. It turns and it can make the radiator hotter or colder, depending on what you want to do, and that way you can zone things around the house. That works out real nicely. Now this house was built in 1897 by a notorious gangster here in the Midwest named John Looney. And he was responsible for murders and extortion, all kinds of horrible things. And he was just a bad guy all the way around. But when he had this place designed and built by his architect, he had him put little angels on the ends of the radiator. Well, no bones. Lots of rumors though about this old house and the gangster that lived in it. And I'll tell you what, there's probably never been a body in here, but this is the behemoth, the boiler, and it's original to the house, 1897, it's 100 years old. Now it was coal fed originally, and they'd open up all these doors and shovel in the coal. But of course that wasn't very efficient, so they turned it into a gas system. And these are all the old controls on it, and they're all still functioning. This still heats 7,200 square feet of this house on three floors, and it actually does a pretty good job. How this works is, is that as the burners heat up the water inside, it goes out through these pipes, and it used to just rise when it got warm through the pipes, no pumps or anything. It'd go up through the radiators, and then as it cooled down, it'd come back down because cold things fall and warm things rise. But it's not a very efficient system. So what they did is some time ago, this is a new one, it's been changed several times, this is what's called a circulating pump and this was added in to help force water up through the piping system to make it more efficient. Now this boiler also has an outside thermostat so that when the temperature outside varies, it starts or shuts off the boiler based on the outside temperature. And it's actually a pretty efficient way to do it. One of the problems with this old beast is it has what we call friable asbestos on it. I'm not going to touch it too much because I don't want to get them in the air, but the little fibers are getting loose, and that's a problem. Now, the piping system still has asbestos around most of it. It's actually not in bad shape, but there are spots where it's not too good, and it can be a danger to your health because the fibers from asbestos get down and attach themselves inside your lungs. So what will end up happening in this house is the boiler will get replaced, and we'll take all the asbestos off the pipes and probably wrap them with fiberglass. Now fiberglass is okay, it's not quite as good as what the asbestos was. In fact, asbestos was a great insulator in every way possible. So one of these days we're gonna have to replace this beast. A long time ago, the asbestos was taken off the pipes in this house and they're wrapping it with fiberglass and you can see right here, it's a fiberglass wrap and they'll continue that process. The reason we're here is because the boiler shelled out and when they're going to replace it. Now, here's a new boiler. This is Dave Jackson. Dave, good to Hi, see Bob. you. Dave handles my boiler stuff here around where I live. What are we looking at here, Dave? Well, this is a replacement uh, as the new new boiler to replace the old monster that we took out yesterday. It's a heck of a lot smaller, isn't it? It's considerably smaller, yes. What makes it, I know it's more efficient, but tell me how. I don't really Well, understand. basically there's two things, Bob. The electronic ignition. Okay. So you don't have the flame on, on a pilot just running all right. the time. Okay, that makes right. sense. That saves a lot of gas. You bet. And the inducer blower, which controls flue gas flow. Okay, so that, that's here and that's tied into this. Right. Now how does that make it more efficient? Well, it's just a blower that controls the flow of the, of the combustibles through the burning chamber and out the chimney. So you're not losing all that heat not, out through the flue. You're not using all the heat being sucked up out the road. Makes good sense. So this one's about how efficient? This one's 82% efficient. You can get them more efficient than that, though, can't you? Yeah, you can, but in this house it wouldn't work out very well. Now here's all the old iron pipes. Talk to me about that. I mean, why are they still here? Well, there's no reason to replace them. Um, we adapt to the old, from the old iron pipe to the new boiler with copper and fittings, as you can see here. And it just is a lot easier to work with copper than it is with the iron. A few years ago, an old boiler guy that I was talking to said that because the water's enclosed in the system, it gets distilled, and there's really no sediment for in the water to, right. to attach onto the pipe, like you see real. in a like a water pipe coming off a water heater. Absolutely, something. the water's real clean. Makes sense. All right, so how much hassle? 
One day, two day, three day? Well, this particular case, because of the, of the extras that we're doing here, is about three days that the boiler will be down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Three days, and how much? Well, this particular job is a little over $6,000. And that's for how many BTUs? This is a big one. It's a 225,000 okay. BTU boiler. Would it be fair to say then, depending on where you live, somewhere between five and $7,000 to that get was, turnkey? That would hit it real close right. in most cases. That also yes. included this flue. Yes. Yeah, now this has all been relined here, going all the way up through the chimney. That's a code and a safety issue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This was just a brick chimney, so it needed to be lined. Makes sense. Dave? Thanks a lot. I really appreciate yeah, it. Bob. We'll Thank you. you later. Generally, when people think about air conditioning, they think about the mechanical system where you have the compressor down on the ground tied into your furnace blowing cold air into your house. Well, here in Seattle, they don't have a lot of temperature extremes, so natural airflow from French doors all the way through the house through the dining room and out another set of French doors is a pretty good way to air condition a house. There's another great way to air condition houses all over the country. It's called the double hung window. Now you raise that bottom sash up to let the cool breeze in and you lower the top sash to let the hot air out. It was actually designed originally for an air conditioning system. So many old houses were designed for really good airflow. Now we're going to talk about all the mechanical systems and their energy efficiency as far as air conditioning a house goes. But just remember, if you live in an older house, it was generally designed for natural airflow. Use it. You can save some money in the spring and fall. Of course, out here in Seattle, central air conditioning generally isn't even needed. One of the most difficult things to accomplish in any old house is air conditioning. Now, we're up in the attic of this house just above the second floor because I wanted to show you this baby right here. Now, this is an air conditioning system, central air. I know it doesn't look like what you're used to. What you're used to seeing is a furnace in the basement with these pipes right here coming out of it. They're copper and they're wrapped going out to a compressor out in the yard next to the house. Same thing. This goes down the wall of this house down to a compressor below. Now, what the air handler does is it has a fan in it and it has a series of coils made out of copper inside. As they cool down, the air flows over them and it comes out the octopus arms here. And it goes along until it gets to a point where it goes down into the floor. And they come out right here. You see this porthole vent? That's where the cold air is coming from the air conditioning unit up in the attic. Now remember, cold air falls, warm air rises. And in a big old house with tall ceilings, you have a big staircase here, you have one in the back. The cold air falls down the staircases and makes it comfortable downstairs and nice and cool upstairs. Works out very, very well. And by the way, the reason this house has a downdraft air conditioning system is because it has a boiler in the basement and not a furnace with ductwork, so you don't have much of a choice. There's one more mechanical air conditioning system that works great for old houses with radiators, and here's the old radiator right here. It's called a high-pressure air conditioning system. Now, down here on the floor is a little porthole. It looks like something out of a speaker. In fact, it is blowing cold air out of there like crazy. It's the vent. It has a nice little oak trim ring around it, just like the floor, so it blends in throughout the whole house. You hardly know they're there. Let's take a minute and go down to the basement. I'll show you how the whole thing works. And this is the heart of the system right here. This white metal box is the air handler, and inside of it is a condensing coil, and that's what makes the air cold. But this pipe coming out the side is just like a standard air conditioning system. It's copper, it's wrapped with insulation, and it goes out to the compressor in the yard. But what really makes this unique is that all that high velocity, high pressure air is coming up through this trunk line, comes up here and goes all the way through the basement, and all these little tiny ducts are tied into it. Now these ducts go to those little portholes in the floor that we saw before, and the cold air just goes right up into the first floor. Now this house has a system up in the attic as well to cool the second floor. And these little ducts just go into the ceiling with their little portholes. But in your situation, you might even want to fish them down into a wall cavity and they're small enough to do that. This system works great for houses with radiator heat. Now we've talked about the ways to get air conditioning into houses with boilers and radiators. Let's take a look at how you can get air conditioning with a standard forced air furnace. The central air conditioning system that most of you are familiar with is called the standard or conventional forced air system. 
Now take a look at this furnace. It's a regular furnace. It's on the second floor and it comes up and you see some ductwork on the top. Well, that's actually called a plenum. Now inside the plenum is a copper coil that works in concert with the compressors down the ground, which I'll show you in just a second. Out of that coil comes a copper pipe that's insulated with the black insulation. It goes up into the ceiling joist, out to the eave, and down the side of the house over here, and down to these compressors. Now these compressors are single stage conventional compressors. Now you can get double stage and triple stage and all kinds of fancy compressors, including natural gas compressors, but I think for your money, you're better off with a single stage. What you do want to remember is the SEER rating, S-E-E-R. It's an acronym for Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio. Now, the higher the SEER rating, the more efficient your unit's going to be. Now the older ones were 8 to 10 sears, and these new ones you can get all the way up to 15 sear. And if you get a 15 sear, it can literally cut your cooling bills in half. That's significant. And that's what this is all about, is saving some bucks. So consider your sear ratings when you're putting in a new compressor unit. It's a beautiful bay window on a very historic old house. It has some paint problems to say the least. Now I'm going to tell you what I call the scenario. And the scenario starts like this. You have a wonderful old house, you love it, but you're sitting in there watching TV and you can feel cold air in the winter infiltrating through. Wow, this is a bummer. I'm uncomfortable. I've got to do something about it. So what do you do? You call the insulating contractor and he comes out to the house and he does this. He drills holes, he puts these little plugs in after they're drilled, he drills holes just like this and blows insulation cellulose into the wall. All right, well that's pretty cool. The problem is, is that you're creating warm, moist vapors inside the house, cooking, bathing, plants, and it's attracted to the cold exterior wall whether it's insulated or not. Now you have plaster on the inside of old house walls and it has no vapor barrier. It goes in through the casings, around by the light sockets, it even permeates right through the plaster and gets into the wall cavity. Now before the insulation was blown in, it could permeate right out. But because the insulation's in there, it hits it, it condensates and it wets down the insulation. Plus hard driven rain and snow and melting and all that stuff can get in where caulking isn't good and it can wet it down as well. So you have two things working against you. All right, so now you have siding is peeling because the moisture is permeating out through the backside of the siding. Oh my gosh, I can't keep paint on my house. What's the next thing you do? Well, you call the siding contractor, of course. He comes out and puts siding all over it and that makes the problem worse because now you have a vapor barrier on the outside trapping all that moisture. It has no way to get out. And this is the type of stuff that you see. This rot was caused because of wet insulation and then that vapor barrier siding over the original trapping all the moisture in. I mean, there's rot all over this area. Now, the people that bought it, thankfully, are going to completely restore it and they understand some of these problems, but they're going to have to replace quite a bit of siding. They're going to keep some of it. Now, let me show you something. Right over here is one of these holes. Let me pull some of this out of here. All right. Now, this little piece of insulation is just soaking wet. I mean, it's just very wet. And that's a problem. You don't want that to happen. So what do you want to do? Well, you could try to create a vapor barrier on that plaster wall by putting up all kinds of fiberglass matting or vapor barrier paints and caulk your beautiful woodwork. And you don't want to do that. It's kind of a hassle. You're just better off not blowing insulation into the side walls, but do this. The holes in your house, the windows and the doors, weather strip them, make them tight, caulk your house well, get a good paint job on the house. That'll take care of that problem. Now, there are a couple of places where I want you to insulate. Let's go take a look. So where are the best places to insulate your old house? Well, let's start in the attic. The attic's really your number one place to go, even if you have a new house. And I like blown in loose fill types of insulation. And there's a couple different types. I'll talk about my favorites here in a little bit. It's really important though, before you blow the insulation in, to consider your ventilation in your attic. Now remember, if you don't have good ventilation in your attic, you could get condensation that would wet down the insulation, and then insulation's no good when it's wet or you could have what we call ice damming. Down by the end of the eave, ice will build up and come up underneath your shingles and leak in if you don't have a good airflow through the attic space. 
So what we start with are these ventilation sheets that you're looking at. And they're made out of plastic or styrofoam and they get stapled to the underneath side of the sheathing between the roof rafters. Now you can see that they put it down into the eave where the floor and the angled roof meet. Underneath that eave is the soffit. There's a vent there. Air flows up through that soffit vent into the ventilation chute and up the roof to hopefully a roof vent. Now these babies are not that good looking, but they do work. Now it's made out of aluminum so it won't rust, and it has a screen on the bottom so bugs can't get in, and it's designed so that wind-driven snow and rain can't get in as well. If you have that, then you have a continuous flow of ventilation in your attic. That'll make your roof shingles last longer, it'll keep your insulation dry and stop the ice damming down at the eave. All that's very, very important. Now just remember these rules. One square foot of net free ventilation for every 150 square feet of floor space in the attic of a new house. Remember, new houses are real tight. They're really weather tight and they're built with all kinds of insulation. So you need that kind of ventilation in a new house. Now, older houses, on the other hand, have a little bit of a leakiness to them, so you can get by with one square foot of net free ventilation for every 300 square feet of floor space in an attic. If you just remember those rules, you're going to have great ventilation. Now, let's go look at some of the ways that we blow insulation in. Well, the next step in this process, of course, is to get the insulation up into the attic. Now, I like fiberglass because it's very fluffy and it does a good job of insulating. Insulation gets its insulating qualities from its fluffiness. Now, this machine up here, he's feeding in the insulation in big bales. It chops it up so it's nice and loose. It comes down through this blower. It comes through this hose that's shaking right here really shows you that it's going through and it goes right up into the attic. Now you don't want to get more than an R38 or an R40 at the max. An R38 will run 15 inches to 16 inches of loose fill and actual thickness up in the attic. And listen, it's not very expensive. 70 cents, anywhere from 50 to about 80 cents a square foot to put it in for an R38 is really cheap. Now you can go to the lumber yard and buy the bags and they'll even give you the blower for free. Let me tell you, it's not worth it. It's too big of a hassle. These guys do it. They come in, it's quick, it's over, and they really know what they're doing. Hey, <laughs> another great place to insulate is down in the basement. Now, it's an area called the box sill. Let me show you here. These beams that you see, and they're all across here, are called floor joists. And they come over, they hold up the floor, they come over, and they rest on top of the foundation. Now, from the top of the foundation, to the flooring, we call this the box sill. Top foundation is the sill area, and there's the flooring, and this big opening in here lets in a lot of air from the outside, a lot of air infiltration. So we really should insulate it, and we did that over here already. Now let me show you the materials. This is called craft-faced insulation, and a roll of this is really inexpensive. It has a paper on one side and no paper on the other. It's about six and a half inches thick when it's all fluffed out. Now to cut it to the size of the box, like we did up here, use a utility knife. Pretty simple little operation. Now it's important to wear a mask when you're working with this stuff. I wear a dust mask with two straps on it because the single straps just don't hold it tight enough to your face. So you get that on there and one strap goes down low and one goes up high. Get it all adjusted just like that. And then this stuff will make your skin itch. You probably should wear long sleeves but I'm gonna get by without it because I'm not doing too much here. Put on the gloves. Now we've cut a piece to fit up in here already. I'm gonna go ahead and put it up there for you. I'm gonna get it up there nice and snug. It's a friction fit, just like that. Now the paper needs to be on the inside of the basement. The reason for that is when you create warm, moist air in the basement or laundry rooms or wherever, it's attracted to the outside wall. If there was no paper here, it would get into the insulation and wet it down. So the paper stops that moisture from getting into it. And besides, insulation is no good if it's wet, believe me. Now, I'm going to take these off because I want to take you upstairs and I want to show you a really, really good place to stop air infiltration. While outlets and switches on exterior walls of your old house let in a ton of air. Now, you can buy these little gaskets up at the hardware store, about $3 for 10 of them, if you can believe it. They're really cheap. And they just fit right over the switch or the outlet like this one. And you have to be careful not to get your fingers in there so you don't get electrocuted. Just make sure it's on there nice and snug. And then get your cover, put it back on, make sure it's on there nice and flat, and put your screw back in, and you are set.
Well, living in an old house can be a really fun and rewarding experience. We need to make them energy efficient. And I think we've shown you some ways today that you can do that because you have to be able to afford to live in an old house. It's really important. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Until next time, I'm Bob Yap about your house. About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation.